to those who I recognize and those who are new. This is a round table. This is the first time that we're actually um, having a round table, um, but it's in honor of or maybe in lamentation of scholars under fire, um, especially in this day and age <coughs> where academic freedom um, and um, censorship is under such scrutiny we thought that it would be a, uh, an important occasion. We have two of our scholars who were recently at a Berlin conference, uh, a conference that goes by the acronym WATS, the Workshop for Armenian and Turkish Studies, that was in fact um, initiated by both Professor uh, Gocek and Professor Ron Suni, along with other colleagues through the auspices of the Armenian Studies Program in the year 2000, so it's actually one that is quite um, entering into its, its third decade mm -hmm. or end of second decade. Um, and so this was really a pioneering bringing together of both Armenian scholars and Turkish scholars to speak in a round table um, or in an organized fashion about and around the genocide. So um, I will just pass um, the, the table on to Professor uh, Miguel Gocek and Ron Sunni to talk to us about a little bit of the background of this workshop and then what transpired in Berlin itself. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gocek and Sunni. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here uh, as always and especially with Miguel who calls me her partner in crime. I call her my collaborator, but the term also can be read in different ways. So uh, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, the broad picture of what's going on in Turkey today and how we got where we are. And uh, Miguel will focus more on current things, I think, and sure. on Watts and so forth. So I'm going to argue that there were three important developments since we first got this idea of starting a workshop in Armenian Turkish scholarship. And they have, these developments have fundamentally changed the public and the scholarly views on the Armenian genocide. And these distant events, however, <clears throat> the Armenian genocide of now 100 plus years ago, has become reluctantly, and we never thought that would happen or should have happened, a kind of contemporary weapon in the acute political debates that are now going on in Turkey. So uh, I will begin by talking a little bit about the emergence of this Armenian-Turkish scholarly dialogue and how in some ways we reached a kind of rough consensus on 1915 through the Watts process. Then I'll briefly review the developments in Turkey since the coming to power of the moderately Islamist party AKP, the Erdogan party. First, uh, a determined effort to end the control of Turkey by the Kemalist Derin Devlet, the deep state, and to democratize the republic. And then the tragic turn after roughly 2011 toward a new authoritarianism under the prime minister and now president Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And then thirdly, and I'll try to be brief, I'm going to illustrate and evaluate the complex imbrication of the Armenian question with current Turkish politics, most importantly, the Kurdish question. So. To begin with, this true understanding of what happened in 1915 and how the Ottoman Empire was destroyed and how the Turkish state, the current state, was created, how historic Armenia was effaced and became present-day Kurdistan, all of these things, as you know, those in this room don't have to be told, suffer from a distorted history which has been battered by professional falsifiers, and government interference. But what Muguet and I did was something we thought really difficult and very optimistic and maybe even utopian at the time, which was to start this dialogue, to bring Kurds and Turks and Armenians together. And it wasn't so easy at first. At first, uh, people were reluctant to come. Muguet has her connections, her networks, and she found people, mostly tenured radicals who had once been in prison, uh, to come to Chicago, where we had our first meeting in 2000. Uh, I had a harder time finding Armenians. They were very reluctant to begin 
a dialogue with Turks who they felt had not yet recognized the genocide. But we gathered a group, and off it went. And roughly, uh, the most incredible res resonance occurred. Now, partly it occurred, the fact that people were willing to come, that this became part of a public debate in Turkey, uh, also was just good luck, a kind of moment at which Turkish politics and civil society in Turkey were also changing at that moment. Um, and it was a moment when Turkey was very interested in entering Europe. So that was the first big thing, opening to Europe, and therefore repression or continued repression of a public dialogue about the genocide was made more difficult. Uh, secondly, Erdogan himself's goal was, of course, to, uh, at first at least we thought, democratize the state and destroy or at least uh, limit in many ways uh, the power of, of the, the military, the police, etc. And after meeting time and again, and we just had the one that Mugay will talk about a little bit, uh, will, uh, the 10th conference at, in Berlin, and as this was happening, <clears throat> a kind of consensus developed, and we changed minds of people, and, and not just Turks and Kurds, but also Armenians, that is, to see this event in much more complex and nuanced way, which was not popular with a lot of people, because on both sides they had rather fixed, almost ironclad discourses about what had happened. And so what I would say is th there were some conclusions that occurred, or some shared opinions. At first it was difficult to get people to agree, of course, on the word genocide, but over time, increasingly more and more people accepted that word on the Turkish and certainly on the Kurdish side where the political authorities, uh, the PKK and so forth, have recognized that term. And the consensus was basically that, yes, there had been a concerted state initiative effort to rid the empire as much as possible of its Armenian and Assyrian subjects in 1915, 1916. That that was carried out not simply by deportation, as some Turks claimed, but also by mass killing, by mass murder. And the third element of that, besides deportation and mass killing, was forced assimilation. So hundreds of thousands of chil children and women, in fact, were not murdered, but became servants, wives, slaves of Turks, Arabs, and Kurds. And those are the people coming out at the moment as sort of Islamicized Armenians. This is something that happened while we were talking about these things without at least me being aware that such things had happened. So the, the events were seen uh, as, as a deliberate effort by the state to carry out this kind of elimination of what they considered recalcitrant, subversive, treacherous populations, right? Allied to the, to the Russians, etc. And secondly, it was largely uh, conceded that there was no mass Armenian effort at insurrection or insubordination. Indeed, in some of our research, we found out, to the surprise of many, that in fact Armenians had organized, mobilized their own young people to fight on the Ottoman side against the Russians. Right? This was something that's been was there, but was played down in a lot of the literature. And tens of thousands of young Armenian boys actually were organized largely by the Dashtar Tsuchun and even by the clergy to fight on the, on the side of the Ottomans. Uh, many of them, some died at the Battle of Sarikamish, and after that battle they were demobilized because now that loss at Sarikamish was blamed on Armenians, the volunteer units on the Russian side. Uh, and uh, they were turned into Amele Tabulara, the work battalions, and eventually they were murdered as well. So this systematic event, you know, was not about simply removal or for security reasons, but was about uh, genocide, that is physical elimination of a designated uh, ethnic, religious, or cultural group. And finally, I would say two other things, and there are many others, and it's in our book, uh, question of genocide, and in Muguet's book uh, on denial, and my book on the genocide itself, uh, all of these things. Uh, there are two, at least, uh, other important things. One, we, we generally agreed, and this was hard for Armenians to accept, there was no pre-existing, pre-war blueprint for these events, that the events were largely contingent. Now, there was plenty of hostility. There was plenty of hatred. There's plenty of what I call in my book affective disposition 
to eliminate, to, not to eliminate, but against Armenians, etc., to deal with them in some way, perhaps quite drastically. And there are isolated uh, statements and so forth about uh, what we must do with these Armenians, eliminate them or whatever. But it's the, it's, the events were relatively contingent in a particular historical conjuncture that is the war itself. And in my book, I say quite strongly, had there been no war, there would have been no genocide. That the war was a moment of great radicalization of the Turks and a move away from other kinds of solutions, even compromises, which they tried to make with the Dashnags toward this most drastic uh, of, all, uh, of all events. And so eventually, uh, one can say that this group at least, and indeed much of what I'd call the progressive intelligentsia, in Turkey accepted the word genocide, and it became possible on television, etc., to talk about these things. Well, that was that moment from roughly <coughs> 2000, 2002, till Erdogan's third victory in, in the elections in 2011, where you had this rather uh, opening uh, for this kind of discussion, along with other kinds of reforms that were going on in the country. Uh, and that began to disintegrate after that period. Erdogan had been allied, with, as you probably know, with this group uh, un, uh, 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 led by uh, Fethullah Gulen, a rather secretive cleric who lives in Pennsylvania, the Hizmet, or service movement. And together, the Islamists and the Gulenists together carried out a series of relatively dishonest, uh, falsified accusations and campaigns against the military, but they effectively disarmed the military at the same time. At the same time, the Gulenists were penetrating the police, uh, the judiciary, etc. And when Gulen himself, or, or that movement, turned against Erdogan, uh, opening up the story, which was evidently absolutely true, that there was corruption that reached into the Erdogan family, Erdogan broke his association with the Gulenists and began to see the Gulenists as well as other groups in the country as, as uh, enemies and as op opponents. The other progressive side, I would say, of the, of the Erdogan's movement was that in, the, in this same period, he made an effort, at least I thought it was sincere at the time, but it turns out it, it led to disaster, to negotiate with the Kurds and to reach some kind of modus vivendi with the PKK, with Ojalan, with Apo, who is the head of the PKK, the, the revolutionary liberation movement of, of the Turkish Kurds, of the Kurds in Turk, Turkey, who was then in prison uh, in an island in, in near Istanbul, Imrala. Uh, and various movements were made. Uh, PKK fighters uh, disarmed or went into, into Iraq. A number of other things happened in that period. But Erdogan had other ambitions, and the ambitions then begin to become more and more evident over time, and that is to become president, all-powerful president of Turkey. And he had a series of elections uh, when he sort of lost the first election because a new democratic Kurdish party, the HDP, uh, was available and it got something like 13% of the vote he wasn't able to get the absolute majority in parliament he would have needed to make this new presidency. And then a very complex sort of series of micro events occurs in which he basically provoked the, the Kurds into attacking certain uh, Turkish uh, units and all hell broke loose and a war was declared against the Kurds. And certain towns in southeastern uh, uh, Turkey were bombarded uh, young people were killed. Uh, uh, the Kurdish in, uh, sort of autonomous movements were basically crushed at that point. And when the second election was called, he won enough of a majority, uh, having created this anxiety and fear about the future, to win that election, and then went on uh, this year to actually win a referendum which allowed its change in the Constitution. That referendum, I was there at the time. I spent the first five months of this year in Turkey. That referendum was probably falsified, almost definitely was falsified. Uh, he won only by a slim margin. Lots of votes were stolen. The campaign was carried out under martial law, under the so-called state of emergency, 
uh, the leading party in opposition, the HDP, was its leaders were in jail. So it was not, in any sense, a fair, a fair referendum. But he squeaked by with a narrow, uh, narrow victory. Uh, if you saw him that night after the referendum, you could tell that he was upset by the slimness of the margin, that he knew that more than half the country was against him, right? which of course makes him particularly dangerous because he realizes how fragile his own hold on the country actually is. Um, and uh, an event that preceded that a year before was, of course, this kind of odd comic opera but quite tragic coup d'etat against Erdogan, which he then used, just as Hitler used the Reichstag fire, just as Stalin used the uh, assassination of Kirov in 1934, as a, as a way to mobilize the country against any of his enemies, uh, 50,000 or so people in jail, hundreds of thousands dismissed from jobs. And Miguel will probably talk about this, the assault on scholarship and journalism, etc. And the last point I want to make is the odd connection that has been made and was made specifically about our conference in Berlin uh, last month is the connection which, that the, uh, uh, of the Armenian issue, the question of the genocide, or current Armenians in Turkey. There's only about 50 or 60,000 of them. Uh, Hakem will know better than I what the actual figures are. He's teaching about this. Um, and the Kurdish movement, right? So that Kurds, uh, when, when one of these Kurdish towns was being bombarded by uh, Turkish troops, a, a officer with a loudspeaker said, you are all Armenians and we'll do to you what we did to the Armenians. So very specific connections. And uh, uh, that these, that, that the, both historic memory of what happened to the Armenians and that the Kurds are that kind of threat, imagined threat today as well. And of course the Kurds are the one people, major group in Turkey that recognizes the genocide and now sees itself as the, as the successor victim of the, of the Turkish state, right? And the slogan you hear all the time, from Kars in the north to Mardin in the south, is they had you for breakfast and they're going to have us for lunch. And uh, so they themselves connect. In the brief period of tolerance and agreement between Erdogan and the Kurds, Kurds in Kurdistan, in historic Armenia, in eastern Turkey, in fact, were celebrating Armenians, naming streets after Armenians, building monuments, restoring churches, again, effectively creating this alliance. Now, that's a very odd and fragile alliance because what it's difficult for Kurds to accept is that they were major perpetrators of the genocide and major benefactors of the genocide. That is, if you go to Kurdistan today, to historic Armenia, if you go to villages, let's say the village where Arshil Gorky was raised, uh, or, or in the city of Van, you see that in that built environment, built by Armenians, those monuments which have not been destroyed, or churches that haven't been turned into barns uh, and, and stalls for animals, you see that it's Kurdish now, that they, they own this landscape, right? And that's, of course, a danger to the Turkish state, and it also makes any connections or sympathies between Kurds uh, and, and Armenians uh, inherently unstable. What the future holds, who knows? But you can say, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that the Armenian genocide is an issue that may be small uh, if you think of the number of Armenians there, but has been built up and exaggerated to the point that is now a kind of threat to the Turkish state. That is, it's symbolic of Europe, modernity, democracy, tolerance, uh, academic freedom. And by attacking Armenians and connecting them with the Kurds, they simply turned this issue around into this major issue. You know, it's not as big as, uh, you know, kneeling in football games in this country, but one of those kinds of things that by itself would not be as significant and yet has been through the, the, the the pinpointing and focusing on it, the state has made a, a, a keystone of whether Turkey will move toward Europe or backwards, and whether it will be democratic or will become, as it is day by day, more and more authoritarian. Well, I'll pick up from uh, that point. Uh, 
and just um, put in some comments and specifically refer to you know, what's and what happened in the last one. Just to add to what uh, Ron said, uh, what is very important uh, in terms of the Gulen movement are probably two things we have to take into consideration. One is the fact that, of course, what Erdogan realized and used <coughs> when he first came to power was Gulen's extensive networks in Turkey. As a consequence, he get a sense of how much Gulen was able to penetrate into civil society and the state. And uh, he decided that uh, he would like to replicate the same model himself. That is what put them actually in, mm -hmm. in, in conflict with one another because they started clashing over appointments to major uh, state positions. Mm -hmm. Because Erdogan started having his own uh, uh, candidate against the Gulen candidate. And, and, and that is, I think, why he, he figured if he could, as he has done, uh, totally marginalize Gulen's uh, followers, he has now, I think, six to eight billion dollars worth of uh, Gulen's establishment and everything taken over by the state, and he is building up on them himself. That's the one component of the Gulen movement that's important. The other one is the fact that he lives in Pennsylvania. Because he lives in this country, by association, Americans, therefore, are complicitous as seen on the other side, so that whatever we do, uh, uh, be it in the US embassy or the consulate or as scholars, we are seen somehow uh, directly associated with, the, with Gulen one way or the other. I mean, so that is, of course, one thing that uh, they uh, uh, falsify to make us uh, apart. The other aspect of the Erdogan uh, hegemony uh, is that even though, uh, you know, uh, I could never buy into uh, this peace movement with the Kurds, I did have a lot of uh, talks with the Kurds at the time when, you know, he, uh, Erdogan sort of uh, wanted to give them the, the, the olive branch and all that, and I said, I mean, this guy has no democratic credentials whatsoever. I mean, you know, um, why on earth are you, like, taking what he's doing seriously? And they said, what other option do we have? I mean, you know, so in a way, I think they were aware, but they didn't have any other options. And that probably explains why uh, they go. And at the time, uh, especially when Davutoglu, uh, who happened to be, uh, you know, an academic before becoming the uh, first uh, minister of foreign affairs and later the prime minister. Uh, Erdogan issued two apologies, uh, one to the Kurds and one to the Armenians, which some Armenians considered very revolutionary. But if you did a critical reading of that and compared it to other apologies that were given internationally, <coughs> and I, you know, wrote a piece on that, it was evident that he was not at all going beyond the us versus them paradigm and not at all empathizing with either the Kurds or the Armenians as uh, human beings first. So that also, you know, I think there were warning signs, but of course he was in power and we couldn't do much about it. What is, of course, uh, very crucial, I think, uh, in terms of uh, the development of what's uh, is that uh, while things started to go down the tubes, uh, uh, we were uh, there in 2011? And during 2015? the Gezi? Yeah, 2011 yeah. for the first time during <coughs> the Gezi events, uh, you know, which was fascinating and we didn't at the time realize it was a turning point because this was reacting against the uh, AKP's uh, Justice and Development Party's neoliberal paradigm in Turkey. Uh, by, you know, cutting down basically all uh, uh, areas um, that were natural and trying to pu put shopping malls everywhere or mosques. I mean, so that was like the thing <coughs> that was going on. And that seems to be a turning point. After then, Erdogan's stand becomes more and more uh, violent. Uh, and it is, as a consequence, you know, when we went back in 2015 again to Istanbul, things were fine, but they didn't appear to be, I mean, we had no problem holding the conference, even though Sabancı University that hosted us there felt a bit uh, sort of nervous, so they didn't want to 
put out um, the conference program till the very last minute, uh, they nevertheless, I mean, we nevertheless had no problem holding the conference there. So that, in a way, emboldened us to think, well, you know, things are now normalized. We can even hold this conference in Turkey without any problems. So we started planning as a consequence of that, uh, the 2017 one in Berlin. But what is, I think, very important uh, in terms of our uh, scholarship and what has been happening as a uh, um, uh, Ron also mentioned, is the fact that uh, the Kurds, of course, come into the picture as a very important variable in addition to the Armenians. And in my own work, for example, I, uh, the Denial of Violence book I wrote basically demonstrates how the genocide, Armenian genocide, was the foundational violence of the Turkish Republic. Uh, in the sense that you know, none of the m most of the perpetrators were not at all held accountable for their crimes, and in the, uh, just the opposite, they became leaders of the Turkish Republic. After that, what I'm now doing is I learn Kurdish, and I'm now looking at the violence against the Kurds, because it is basically by destroying the Armenians and also profiting from you know, that destruction and not being punished for it, I argue, I will argue in this book, that allows them to go on and use exactly the same violence against the Kurds. Establishing that continuity, I think, is very dangerous for the Turkish state because you can then see this, this arc of violence that goes from one to the other. And for the first time in the 2007 uh, workshop, we included the Kurds. Uh, quite a number of uh, Kurdish, uh, you know, people who work on uh, the, the relation between Armenians and Kurds, which seems <coughs> to be the, the one relation nobody wants to talk about. As a consequence, uh, you know, th th first there is this radical nationalist party that uh, took us on, and they said that uh, we, were we were Americans uh, who developed this project uh, to create a, a second uh, uh, Israel, Israel yeah. by establishing, Kurd help establish Kurdistan. I mean, so that was one of the major things mm. that they brought forth, more <coughs> than the Armenian part. <laughs> second Israel. I mean, you, you never know well, how important things we're engaged in here. I mean, you think we're just mere scholars. No. But because of, of, of that, I think, Kurdish connection, uh, what then happened uh, was that this uh, party then said uh, uh, they started uh, because we were emboldened and decided to put the conference online much earlier, they were able to then get all the names of the people who are, you know, Turkish citizens, <coughs> as well as who are in Turkey, including uh, the sponsorship of Sabancı University, and protested against them by actually uh, uh, forcing the Institute of uh, Higher, Edu the Higher Education Council uh, to uh, Sabancı University to withdraw their sponsorship and also to withdraw uh, the sponsorship of all universities from whom uh, scholars were going to attend the, uh, the, our workshop. So that is basically the, the blow uh, that came. Sabancı immediately withdrew their name. Uh, Hülya Adak, who was one of the organizers from Sabancı, who had organized the 2015 uh, conference, actually, had to also disassociate her name. Uh, and the people uh, said, uh, even if she came uh, on her own, uh, they may not even, uh, they may take her passport away at the airport, and she couldn't risk that. And that's why she decided not to come. And later, she went to Germany without any problem, so obviously it was evident this was, you know, they wanted uh, to remove that. There was one other uh, scholar uh, who was coming from a prominent uh, Turkish university who had to withdraw because of these uh, forces. But those uh, who, who lived uh, outside were able to come. So that, you know, we did have most people, even though, of course, all this pressure uh, to a certain degree uh, caused a lot of problems because uh, in organizing this conference, Ron and I were here in, in the States. Uh, Hülya was in Turkey while this was going on. And then the main organizers were in Germany and they hadn't organized something like this before. 
and they were the ones doing the on the grounds work. And as a consequence, we had a hard time communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, the participants, we thought there was a unique name created for the count, what's 2017. Usually when that's the case, uh, there's a cultural difference here between the United States and Germany. When you have such a name, we assume that all conference participants are included in such a group. It turns out, no, in Germany, they only include the leaders, not the, the rest. Mm -hmm. So it included just our names. We already knew all of us, so I don't know why, but we were under the impression for like about like three, four days when all this was happening, that everybody was getting our messages. It turns out none of them were. Mm -hmm. And this didn't occur as a big issue to the German people, so that's why we were like put off uh, and had a, a problem initially because then some younger participants who then started to be, uh, you know, uh, literally um, harassed in this uh, nationalist media thought that we didn't uh, provide them with enough support. Mm. We didn't, but unintentionally, obviously. And then we had to therefore, when they come sort of- cont yeah. Yeah. Contingencies. Contingencies. <laughs> Contingencies, yeah. And then <coughs> when they came, you know, we settled all of this uh, the leader of this nationalist party, uh, radical party, came to Germany, to Berlin. Uh, he invited everyone to come and harass us. He had a press uh, release or a press conference, uh, uh, but nobody went to it, it turns out. And uh, with respect four to- four demonstrators Yeah, outside with respect to the harassment, uh, we of course had to notify the police forces and everybody else. and. Uh, but then only four of them showed up and you know there one of them tried to actually infiltrate uh, our conference uh, and he was caught and uh, ejected uh, but we were able to hold the conference uh, and uh, the results are now going to be uh, published also um, as an edited volume uh, so in a way uh, this gave us a sense of of what was happening at the conference, we always also make sure that we involve uh, young scholars as well as established ones. In addition to that, we also start thinking about where to hold the conference <laughs> next. Uh, we pretty much uh, have uh, Amsterdam, probably, the uh, University of Amsterdam and the uh, Center in uh, Genocide Studies will be the host in two years. And so we go on strong. I mean, one interesting thing about the <coughs> space we created with Watts is that in a way, uh, most of the time the state is able to harass people because of the continuity they have in their methods and in instruments of violence. We've also realized <coughs> that we can use our institutional continuity as you know, universities and university professors to <laughs> counter that uh, in, in an interesting way and to sustain that space. And in this case, included, I mean, expanded actually to bring in uh, not only the Armenian issue, but what it has, Armenian genocide, but what it has literally evolved into uh, in Turkey as this destabilizing factor of what uh, the um, uh, Turkish state is trying to do by unifying and making ethnic, Turkish, ethnic Turks the hegemonic group over all other groups by erasing all other groups. And I think it is because of that uh, very important uh, to sustain uh, for us uh, this connection with the Kurds, which we intend to do. We're not giving up on that one. Uh, so I'll just uh, leave there and uh, um, see your questions. I do not know what the Sabancı University will do. Uh, or Julia, they, what they told us is that they will be there supporting us informally, but they will not have their names there as long as this happens in Turkey, because <coughs> that is very important, and what happened uh, in terms of the academics in Turkey, the turning point was this peace petition that we all signed in January 2016. Uh, the peace petition said because they basically stopped the Kurdish peace movement, they started to literally massacre the Kurds. As a consequence, uh, a lot of like-minded academics, including myself, we signed uh, this petition saying the Turkish state should not settle this uh, issue uh, with violence, but with diplomacy. We thought this was just another petition we signed. Uh, the 
Erdogan and everybody came against us and said that we were not <coughs> only were we traitors, but uh, there was no difference between us and the PKK guerrilla organization, and we were guerrillas. And as a consequence, they used that petition as a way to literally remove uh, and stigmatize a lot of people, two of whom committed suicide as a consequence. Many others lost their jobs uh, or had to leave Turkey. Or went to jail. Or right? went to jail, exactly, at the beginning. And some are, and others, most of them <coughs> uh, left. We now have an academy in exile in Germany to you know, deal with it, in France as well, as well as in the United States with scholars at risk. Uh, I can not be able to go back to Turkey since I signed that peace petition, but uh, as you probably know, these things make one uh, even stronger uh, in, in, in continuing one's battles rather than giving up. So we are going on strong, <laughs> aren't we? Except I'll tell you a story <laughs> about that peace petition. So the, um, uh, I gave the Hiran Dink Memorial Lecture on the 10th anniversary of his assassination at Boazici. And afterwards, they took us into the VIP room, and we're having things to eat, and Haran's widow was there, and this. And a woman came and sat next to me and said, I'm so-and-so, and I just got out of jail. I said, really? Oh, why were you in jail? She said, oh, I signed this peace petition. I said, oh. And I'm thinking, did I sign that petition? <laughs> I'm going to be here for five months. And she said, Professor Sunni, I want to thank you. You were one of the first foreigners to sign the petition. Oh, of course I did. Of course I signed it. <laughs> Somehow I stayed there you for did. five months. Yeah. Yeah, nobody bothered me, well, but I'm yeah. a foreigner. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not exactly. a Turk. Yeah. <coughs> anyway. Well, thank you. Um, let's open up the room for questions. The only thing that I'll ask you is if you could just use the mic because this whole session is being recorded. So I'll just pass and here's another mic. Do you want to the mic, mic yeah. to you? Hi. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen, as I have, the, the quote commonly attributed to Hitler you know, nobody who remembers the Armenians. I, I'm wondering if you've ever been able to track that down, because frankly, it sounds like almost too perfect a quote. <laughs> Plus, you know, it's well known that Hitler, you know, never signed anything tying him directly to the to the Shoah. So, so it sounds a little too perfect. And, and secondly, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, sort of the Reichstag fire aspect of of attacking uh, Fulin. I mean, was this network that you <coughs> talked about really a threat? Was he really involved in the coup planning? I mean, I realize nobody knows for sure, but what, what's your sense? Maybe I'll do the Hitler one, you do the Gulen one. Okay. No, you, you do the second one, I'll do the first one. <laughs> the Hitler one? Well, yeah, because of Stefan Erik, no? I mean, oh, you could do that, yeah. Okay. okay. I, I was going to say, fight. actually, the, the we may even have a disagreement about this. That is, the, the, um, the Hitler quote is suspect, and, but it is not the only quote. There are a half a dozen, you know, different moments at which he talks about the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. And what Miguel is referring to is this very good scholar who was our keynote speaker <coughs> at in this Berlin, meeting yeah. in Berlin, mm -hmm. Stefan Erich, who wrote two books, one, Ataturk and the Nazis, and the other on Turkey and the Armenian genocide in which he demonstrates, you know, that he, uh, Germany, and, Germany the and the Armenian genocide. He demonstrates, you know, the closeness and how Hitler did know about all of these things. And Hitler used several different uh, uh, historical moments to discuss what he wanted to do with Germany and Eastern Europe. And one was the American extermination of Native Americans. He applauded people like Andrew Jackson and so forth. And of course, the Armenian genocide was also an event that he admired because it was a way of a state dealing with a population that you want to get rid of. You know, ethnic cleansing or genocide is because you want the land, but you don't want the people on the land, and this was a way to do it. So there's plenty of evidence that he knew what was going on, and it was part of his Weltanschauung, and that's in the book that, that Miguel mentions. The Reichstag one, you know it better than I do. I don't. The Reichstag fire was set by a, 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 a lunatic Dutchman, uh, in 1933, just after the Nazis first came to power. And they then blamed it on the communists. They had a trial. It turns out the communists weren't involved. Dimitrov got off and went to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But they used that to convince Hindenburg 
to put emergency measures in, which then Hitler used to get rid of the communists, the socialists, the labor unions, and create a dictatorship. And Stalin did a similar thing with the Kirov assassination. We used to think that maybe Stalin killed Kirov. It turns out it's not true. He was a friend of Kirov. He loved Kirov almost like a son. Uh, and, and Kirov was assassinated, again, by a kind of crazy guy named Nikolaev, who was a discontented office seeker. Uh, a small event, but then Stalin used it against Zinoviev and Kaminev, and off you go to the purges. Mm -hmm. So this is a very similar thing that he did with the Kurds. Yeah. Who wants to ask a question? Well, I could, will. Could I just uh, ask again, what, to, what, to what extent do you think the suggestions that Fulin was behind the coup or that his uh, network was, was oh, yeah, a real yeah, threat yeah, exactly. to the yeah, Turkish yeah. state? Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, yes, this, is, this goes back to the alleged coup. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so you can argue that the peace petition was one way uh, in which basically all liberal Western educated uh, faculty in Turkey were targeted and ousted, uh, uh, or anyone who tries to uh, uh, practice uh, scientific you know, research according to uh, scientific standards established in the West became uh, I mean, you know, suspect and uh, were ousted because of these connections. Uh, then the, you can argue that the second stage of that uh, happened uh, with, the, with this alleged coup because he wanted, Erdogan wanted to get rid of about uh, 300,000 people who were all in, in different parts of, of the bureaucracy, in, in the judiciary, and in other places. And he couldn't just write out, take so many people out, there would be a huge uprising. What happened was at the time, there is, I personally know, I mean, think, and it has been also documented by others who have written on this, people knew that uh, including the National Intelligence Agency, of course, to which, uh, whose uh, knowledge and information uh, Erdogan has access to, there were definitely some people within the military who were not happy with Erdogan, were thinking of a coup. There were others also, you know, Gulenis who thought that it was time to take action. I mean, but these I don't think were in any way uh, systematic or a concerted effort. I mean, they had just sort of thought about organizing it. And, and somehow, I think he got the National Intelligence a Agency to basically force them, unite them, and sort of, sort of to thinking that this was the time to carry it out. So it was evident from the beginning that it wasn't going to succeed, because they knew uh, there is this one uh, academic, young academic who was a postdoc here actually, he uh, did a timeline and it was evident, for example, that uh, uh, AKP, um, you know, members or uh, people supporting the party uh, through the mosques knew that there was something happening before it started happening. So they started mobilizing against it at the same time. What that, of course, enabled uh, Erdogan to do uh, was uh, used that uh, to literally get rid of hundreds of thousands of people again uh, from uh, you know very similar I guess to Stalin and uh, Hitler uh, all these uh, opponents of all kinds so that's what's behind the coup. Gulen yes some Gulen is probably did it I mean obviously he doesn't like the guy who ousted him but I don't know how much power he actually had in Turkey or how much control he has over them. I think it was uh, trumped up, definitely. One of the worst things that I noticed in Turkey when I was there was, okay, there are people who, the country is very divided, and <clears throat> I would say slightly less than half support Erdogan. And the coup, the violence that took place, his rhetoric, you know, we're going to cut off their heads, he uses very bloody rhetoric, mm -hmm. has really incited people to a new level of bloody-mindedness, you know, not that in this country we're not familiar with these kinds of mm -hmm. things, provocations from how on top, and how discourses can radicalize, mm -hmm. you know, even if it's a minority of the population. Mm -hmm. But one of the worst effects is that there are others, I hate to say this, including one of my own students who now teaches at a major uh, Turkish university, who have begun to trim their views. 
and even in order to save their skin, right, and remain in their own country, have now taken the party line. Mm. And one very prominent scholar, who will remain nameless, Halil Verchai, has in <laughs> fact uh, gone over to the dark side. And he's not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see, and this has several bad effects. Imagine that someone you're close to, that was a progressive, that was at our first meeting mm -hmm. of, of Watts, that when it was dangerous to be at Watts, mm -hmm. right, uh, now is supporting Erdogan. And how that divides that fragile community mm -hmm. of what I call the progressive Turkish intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to take a side, mm -hmm. and people, some of them go over to the dark side. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad. Mm -hmm. And some universities like Bilgi are trying to hold out, but how long they can do it, you know, or the Hrant Dink Foundation, or, you know, mm -hmm. I gave five lectures there, and they told me only after the five lectures that there were three or four, two or three, um, civil policemen in the audience at every lecture. I, said, I hope they learn something. <laughs> <coughs> I have, uh, thank you very much for illustrating me at least in all these subjects. Uh, I have three questions. The first one is, what is the essence of the Gulen movement? Mm -hmm. The second question is, what is of the memory of Hatatürk in Turkey? And the third question is, what are the practical consequences which may happen if Turkey acknowledge the Armenian Holocaust? Hmm. You answer the third, I'll answer one. Okay. Answer. <laughs> okay, well, the first, uh, the origins of the Gulen movement. Gulen himself uh, is a cleric, originally, uh, from uh, the east. Is it Van or Erzurum? Yeah, Erzurum. it's like it is. Yeah. Kars? Erzurum. Erzurum, yeah. okay, there we go. Uh, from Erzurum, and uh, he became uh, quite prominent uh, during the Turkish Islamic synthesis uh, at a time when uh, Turkish nationalism and Islamic religion were sort of trying to put together an almost, you know, Turkish interpretation of Islam. And uh, as a part of that, what is very important is that he used education to mobilize uh, and, and uh, um, diffuses impact. Uh, the modus operandum is that he would have uh, raised money from his followers uh, who would give about 10 to 15 percent of their salary through Chankaya Vakf uh, to Gulen. That money would be then used to recruit uh, young, uh, smart males from poor uh, families where they would all be placed in dormitories, in urban centers, and helped attending uh, especially uh, colleges or high schools and colleges depending on, on their age. And as a consequence of this uh, gift, they would then be sent to Gulen schools and <coughs> would have to do uh, service there for at least five to 10 years uh, to pay back what had happened. So what he did was he used these uh, to then literally colonize civil society through education, both in Turkey and overseas all over as well, and sustain this. Uh, uh, as a consequence, of course, people who graduated not only went uh, to, uh, as teachers to these schools, but also then went into you know, civil service, you know, the judiciary, the police, and that's how he was, and the military, <coughs> that's how he was able to spread his influence. Uh, so that is uh, also the model, I think. Uh, the success of it is what Erdogan is planning to copy uh, to colonize uh, Turkey uh, at the moment. So that is that explains uh, the Gulen movement. With respect to Atatürk, uh, initially, of course, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was seen because of the independence war uh, as, a, uh, as the hero that established uh, uh, the republic. But because of uh, most of the literary reforms that Atatürk carried out were ones that the Union and Progress had put together before in the last stages of the Ottoman Empire. So there is a very important continuity there between the Ottoman Unionists and later the Turkish Kemalists, uh, you know, as they shed their uh, violent past uh, as perpetrators and became the heroes of the Turkish Republic. I think that continuity was not very clear because Atatürk literally hegemonized and uh, sort of declared himself as if he single-handedly saved the Turkish Republic and established it and totally 
sort of took over what his retinue also did, of course, for him. And that cult uh, was sustained in Turkey because of the Turkish militaries, of course, legitimating their position within Turkish society uh, through their connection to Atatürk. So what happens as a consequence is, of course, once there is this opposition to the military that starts emerging around Islamist circles, there is uh, within them an anti uh, uh, you know, stand where they start emphasizing all those people that Atatürk marginalized for being too religious and not enough secular. So there has been a shift in Atatürk's location in Turkey, but not uh, but he is still sacred, too sacred to take on directly. So you see him still <coughs> there, but he is not a part of the discourse, at least legitimating uh, Turkish state and government in a way he used to before. And now yeah, yeah. So the consequences of uh, if they in fact gave up the, this, this uh, denial yeah, of, of yeah. the genocide, yeah? The, uh, first of all, it's Turkey in the period we've been talking about has been moving steadily in a certain direction toward the right, mm -hmm. away from Europe, towards even a deeper and quite um, integ integral kind of nationalism. Okay? Uh, so now Erdogan is, is uh, allied with the most right-wing party, the MHP, the, 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 the MHP, the, the, the real gray, um, people close to the gray wolves and people like that. Very, And so it's unlikely that they're going to do this or make any concessions to Kurds or, or to Armenians or recognize the genocide. It's a turn away from Europe, right? from democracy, et cetera. Because all of these issues are, are very much connected one with the other. Of course, people ask in Turkey, you know, and, and the very first time I ever spoke about the genocide in 1998 in Turkey, uh, a young woman, I mean, this question was asked, why don't we recognize it? And <clears throat> one of the things is, and it goes back to something that McGay was just saying, there is a founding myth about how the Turkish Republic was made and who Turks are. And they, that republic was created in what's called Kurtuluş Savaşı, that is the liberation war, the war for freedom. Uh, and it's a war that was directed against Armenians, foreigners, the British occupying Istanbul, Greeks who almost got to Ankara, the French in Cilicia and others. Right. And it's quite an extraordinary achievement that a group of people in Eastern Anatolia under Kemal and others, mm -hmm. Karabik, Bekir and others, organized a national movement and, a mo and an army that defeated all of these things. It's just like the Bolsheviks in the Civil War. They managed to, from the, this core, defeat their enemies, foreign and domestic, and take over the country. And that, Kortulu Savasha, that war of liberation is the founding myth. And part of that myth Mugay again made this point, was that we are not the Ottoman Empire and we are not the Young Turks. In fact, we are going to kill some of those Young Turks like Dr. Nazim. Uh, we're not those guys. But as Mugay has said, and our friend Eric Zucker has shown in a very detailed book, basically the same people were in control. And the same ideology with some changes. It's not going to be an empire anymore. It's going to be a nation state. Became the dominant myth of this new state. And so Armenians are seen as traitors, the enemy, a subversive element, a, 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 a country that wants to take a piece of Turkey, etc. Right? Uh, and that mythology and that, that view maintains itself to the present time. So to try to get rid of it, of course, let's say some miracle happened and you had a, a liberal democratic government come to power and they recognized the genocide. You know, Two things would happen. One, Turkey would have made a really fundamental step toward the West, toward democracy, towards liberalism, tolerance, multiculturalism, and all the rest. And two, the Armenians would be very confused as what to hate let next. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't know what to do. So much of our identity, or you can stop me here if you like, but so much of our identity is connected to hatred of Turks, uh, less Kurds now, but mm -hmm. hatred of Turks, danger felt from Turks, victimization, the genocide, that it's very hard for us to get a kind of post-genocidal identity and find it. We should, but it's, it's not in the cards at the moment. Um, sure, just if you kindly take the microphone. Thank you. How much is the continuing clash between these three groups uh, religious? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, 
you see, religion had been marginalized in Turkey for <coughs> so long uh, that I think until uh, the Justice and Development came to power in 2002, we had no idea whether they would be any different uh, because of the ethical dimension, the moral dimension. And uh, given how much corruption and everything has gone down, I mean, even though they are using religion as a political instrument, when it comes down to it, I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, Erdogan cares about religion any more than he cares about anything else. I mean, it, it's for him, it's whether he, it, it, it enables him to get more power uh, at the expense of other people. So I do not see it as being uh, very religious uh, at all uh, from that point of view. I mean, likewise, um, the sort of this being a Muslim Christian thing, I mean, you know, that also uh, has been shown uh, to be maybe a, a mitigating factor, but not a determining one. I mean, you know, so that also, I think, uh, uh, has limited power in explaining what's going on. Um, he, Erdogan uses religion the same way he used democracy, instrumentally. Exactly. Yeah. You know, he even said once, democracy is a bus that you yeah. get off when you want to. You know, you, you use it for so far. And remember, he began with this whole headscarf business, mm -hmm. right? That is, there was, there was intolerance of religious display in secular Kemalist Turkey. Mm -hmm. And so you could make a kind of argument that, okay, now we're going to tolerate, we're going to open the public sphere to, to some expression of religion. <clears throat> and that was a, a, the opening wedge. And tolerance of Armenians and maybe better relations with Alevis and with Kurds and others, all of that was in the mix. But... Uh, you know, I'm very confused about it, and I think McGay has a real point there. How genuine is this? This is not Iran. This is not, and, and this, they're not going toward, uh, you know, a kind of clerical state, because that would be another rival group. We don't want that. Exactly. Maybe if there the Gulen no yeah. alliance had continued, it would have been different. But, but now they're allied with, with secular nationalists, with, you know, yeah. really rabid right-wing nationalists, really evil people. Thank you very much, Ron and Muge. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. Mm -hmm. But I just want um, to, I'm thinking on a positive note. I, I think. <laughs> That's good. Okay, <laughs> yes. how about this for, for a bit? Because, I mean, the, the, what we are seeing, and this is not something uh, peculiar to Turkey, we've mm -hmm. seen attacks on academics in Egypt, in China, mm -hmm. different parts of <coughs> the world, which is, in a way, uh, governments are more and more. Uh, that are moving towards the right are fearing academics and academic discourse. So in a way that the academy is more and more involved in politics and its weight through the writers, scholars, students are posing a threat to these regimes. So I'm, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening as, as a, a positive note and I wanted to, to see what you think of this. The other question I want to ask you, uh, which is also positive, that genocide uh, deniers, you know, the age of Bernard Lewis and McCarthy and uh, the other uh, Heath Laurie, and you know, no one, uh, to my knowledge, in, in any uh, uh, respected circles of historians and academicians and activists are not only quoting them, but are not taking them seriously anymore. So don't you think that despite the fact that there is a persistence of the Armenian question in Turkey, that, you know, we've moved so far that, in a way, the Turkish state has lost the academic and scholarly battle. Thank I you. think that's well, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's right that, that we did something good. I mean, we started a thing, and it had a resonance that we couldn't have expected. Yeah. Because we were deliberately anti, uh, not anti, but apolitical. We were not going to be political, though the topic itself, by definition, was political. You couldn't get away from it. But we were going to try to be as, as academic and scholarly and objective and neutral and all the rest of it. Uh, and, 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 and that was impossible in that particular field. But we were trying to move scholarship away from where Armenians and Turks had been, which was debate about, was there a genocide? We just said, there was something there. We'll see what we call it. But <clears throat> and very quickly, it was clear that this was genocide, right? But, but rather than fight on the turf that the Turks, uh, Turkish government had left us, you know, we denying that anything really like this had happened. We, we, that we, that's what we did. 
And, and it, it was extremely important at that time that we did this, um, that we legitimate this kind of scholarly intervention. And Hakem, you're absolutely right. This is a global attack. Now, there always is that. There was under McCarthyism. <clears throat> there certainly was <coughs> in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. Um, and there will be in the United States. <clears throat> in some ways, you know, now it's football players. It could be academics tomorrow if, if Trump decides that, uh, uh, well, you know. Seen it. <laughs> <laughs> He's already starting to do that. <coughs> I, I think you better go. I can't. <clears throat> No, I, I was going to say more, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm got yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, so it is true, yes. I mean, that is why I was, I ended up by saying we're going to continue, there is an <coughs> institutional continuity, because if you think about uh, the number of people, I mean, you were one of the attendants of, the, of Watts, uh, we have many others, and now you have become our colleagues. I mean, you know, so there are more and more people now that you can draw on if you wanted to. At the time, we didn't even have anyone working on this mm. issue to bring to a workshop. Yes, now we, can, <coughs> we have enough people to do three workshops or four if we put our minds to it, I mean, if not more. And if you look at especially people who are writing their PhDs, uh, you know, in both the Armenians and the Kurdish, of course, issue, you can see that, uh, yes, the <coughs> institutions and these things are going in a positive way. But of course, uh, what's unsettling in Turkey probably is sort of there was this recognition which made us so you know hopeful that finally we were going to have an enlightened modern, modern democratic so, you know state and society suddenly sort of making this you know turn into populism that is dispiriting but you're right i mean i don't think uh, uh, as we say i mean you know we know what we're doing and we'll continue doing it and i think uh, eventually, uh, it will prevail over the state policies. Whether we'll live to see it, I don't know. Yeah, think. you're right, uh, Hakim, that <clears throat> the, old, the old denialism died. Mm -hmm. That victory we can claim some success for, that's true. There is a neo-denialism. Mm -hmm. There are people like Eric, uh, this Edward Erickson or Sean McMeekin, and there are others who are writing a much more sophisticated and subtle denialism, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there was an insurrection, uh, the, the Armenians did have these intentions, etc. Right? <coughs> and if you read, uh, but at the same time, and I can see people like Zovinar and others in this room, there, there's a new generation doing really serious archival work, the nitty-gritty kind of reconstruction of late Ottoman history, early Republican history, that's changed everything. Now you can't do uh, his, Armenian history here, Kurdish history there, mm -hmm. and, and Turkish history there. You have to do an imperial kind of history, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people, uh, there are lots of Turks and Kurds who are learning Armenian yeah. or Greek to do this kind of thing, or Armeno Greek, or Arme Armeno Turkish. Or, and Armenians are yeah. learning Turkish. And also, Armenians yeah. are learning Turkish. And so there is this development that's independent of the political uh, mm -hmm. winds that are blowing. And by, their, by definition, the kind of work they do is very different from the kinds of work even we can yeah. we were capable of doing because they're all <coughs> these whole new areas of and interpretations yeah. Yeah. we had no idea about it, that are very solid. It's on. It should be on. <coughs> when I was <coughs> when I was listening to you, I had some perhaps crazy ideas, but you know me. Um, and I was thinking of possible parallels between Turkey and Japan, mm. that Japan's clearly a much more democratic place. But if you think about the push toward emphasis on uh, dominance by one ethnic group, ethnic homogeneity, if you think about the denial, as I understand it, continuing in Japan about what they did to the Chinese, World War II, you think about the push even in recent years toward changes in the educational system in Japan and toward textbooks and uh, such that and the increased push toward renewal of some militarism. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you'd think I was nuts or if you think there's there and if you think there's something there what you make of it. Actually John Foran has written a book 
comparing uh, oh. <coughs> denialism, <laughs> uh, denialism of, of Japan and Turkey, uh, you know, in a way. Oh, that's yeah, mm -hmm. I will give you the reference. Yeah, yeah no, it is yeah. very interesting. Uh, there are indeed, I mean, and that's always why I, for example, am very interested in what goes on in New Zealand, because we have to have, in Argentina, because we have to have, you know, positive models of how do you come to terms with violence in your own past. And well, if you think of Kiel's work yes, on this, yes, that's also which I read a lot of, yeah. it's so interesting <coughs> that what's worked in Japan to get more work rights for certain people hasn't been anything related to basic rights or moral authority. It's embarrassing Japan in front <coughs> of the world yeah. in terms of where they want to look like good guys. Exactly. And if we think about some of the things you were saying about Erdogan and such, it makes me think that, that I don't see much fundamental change in Japan toward a more egalitarian or democratic view of much of anything, but it's just yeah. these sort of um, practical ways you can kind of paint people into a corner. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there are any implications for this for Turkey about what could be done to well, in a certain sense, embarrass Erdogan, the Turkish authorities, to acting a little, t a little less awful. Well, embarrassment is a good way to go. Unfortunately, because of the foundational war of independence being fought against the West, uh, you can, you can, they, they argue that this is an embarrassment the West brings on in order to sort of make us uh, dependent on them again, or you know, put us into the second, you know, status, second class status. So I don't know. History is never settled. <coughs> history is always contested. Says the no, yes. it's just true that, and that's how you know the younger generation will get tenure. You know that is, we have to keep revising and and uh, and keep working on it. And it's all it's often threatened by, by governments and by nationalists. You know, yeah. nationalists in particular, need to develop mythologies that defend a certain uh, view of the world that's, that's you know, quite detrimental to honest scholarship. And inherently violence, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, so um, thank you for the presentation. Um, no, he already has. Oh, he has this a, is. Oh. Yeah. A very stylish uh, one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it has been cited that at one point Özal um, pursued an attempt at genocide reconciliation so can you evaluate the claim and also um, perhaps um, make a prediction on what would have proceeded from such a attempt? Well, uh, there are always myths about, yes, uh, Turgut yeah. uh, because uh, they say that he also came of Kurdish origin uh, and from Anatolia, he had them much more, uh, because if you go and talk to people in, in Anatolia, about their past, which I did for five summers. Uh, they all talk about, you know, killing Armenians. They show you the way <coughs> where they deposited the bodies and this and that. So it is a part. And I thought, you know, totally erroneously that since Erdogan was surrounded by, by people who came from Anatolia, that will bring with them the recognition, you know, because it was a part of their own history. But of course, unfortunately, the denial took over. In Turgut Azar's case, uh, his attempt was very much uh, to integrate Turkey to the rest of the world, I mean, to the West. And he, they say that he offhandedly said, uh, so what's the big deal? Let's just recognize this genocide and be done with it, I mean, literally. Mm -hmm. And then the foreign ministry said, wait, 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 you don't know what you're getting into, and pulled him back, and some people uh, conspiracy theories to this day say that because of <coughs> his attempts to solve the Kurdish and uh, the Armenian problems by acknowledging what had happened was the reason why he had the heart attack. It was like, you know, he was taken out basically. Because, of course, the system that exists in Turkey benefits from the denial. They will not benefit from the acknowledgement. No. Once you acknowledge this violence, you will have to rewrite uh, Turkish history. All the heroes are going to become bad guys. And it is going to be, people think that uh, it will lead to Turkish dis disintegration once the foundational myth is gone. And that is what you know, people are worried about. I think that will not happen. But then again, we are idealists and you know, I think optimists too, right? And reparations. 
and reparations. Oh, yeah. Question. Yeah. I mean, it, people also know, especially people I've talked to in the foreign ministry and officials know that sooner or later they're going to have to acknowledge the Armenian genocide. But they figure the later they do it, the less it will cost them financially. Okay. Go figure. <coughs> Nobody talks about the moral costs, you know, the human costs and all that. But Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, uh, a while back, I was in another uh, sort of a similar gathering, um, and um, uh, it was pointed out that um, uh, the Turkish government uh, is uh, trying to uh, connect uh, their past mm -hmm. or the ancestral origins to the Hittites. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, so uh, I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, however, if you um, look at uh, the origins of the Armenians and the origins of the Kurds, of there is almost no uh, um, um, uh, discuss no uh, conf no uh, how should I say this, uh, no question <coughs> that they were they're prehistorically. Of course. It, um, all you have to do is dig a hole by one of the mountains and, you know, yeah, you have it, <laughs> there they are, they've <coughs> been here. And uh, do you think that uh, uh, um, this obvious uh, cultural uh, origin mm -hmm. is a part of uh, this fear of uh, Extending the uh, f uh, f friendship, hand of friendship. Here, you've been here this long, yeah. and uh, uh, why can't we uh, be friends? Uh, well, if you do that, you you become the the younger, yeah. immature uh, kind of a. Exactly. And th uh, do you think that that's uh, is anything? In oh yeah, that's you're exactly right. I mean, Turks came to Asia Minor in the 11th century. Before that, they were not there. I mean, you know, as a consequence, they're latecomers both to Islam and to Asia Minor. And when they came there, of course, there were already Kurds and Armenians, and they had been there for a very long time previously. As a consequence, how do you then legitimate living there and, and ruling over these lands? Well, you do it by a, when you claim Hittites, uh, <laughs> You sort of say, oh, now, you know, we had come f here much earlier, which they hadn't. <coughs> Back then, nobody knew, you know, who was there or what, uh, to claim that as your own heritage. It's totally mixed up. But I was just talking to another colleague, and we, he, he says that for Erdogan, the major important date is 2071. <coughs> I was thinking it was 29, uh, 23 because it's the 100th year of the Turkish Republic. Uh, no, it is 2071. Manzikert. M Manzikert, yes. Because uh, Manzikert, uh, the Battle of Manzikert is the first battle uh, in 1071 <coughs> when the Turks are trying, trying to penetrate into the Asia Minor against the Byzantines. So that is what he is going back to. That and so it's a very interesting Turkish Islamic synthesis, and he was then to say we've been here for a thousand years, therefore long enough, long long enough. enough delegitimating all the claims of people who have been there for two to five thousand years before them. We exactly. we mark uh, uh, the date of 451, so we go back another <laughs> six or seven hundred years. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. our, our time has come to a close. I wanted to thank <coughs> both Ron and Miguel. I think there's a, a, you should write this up because I think there is a really interesting parallel story of these rhythms mm -hmm. of both the history of Watts and the coming to power mm -hmm. of Erdogan. And so it would be really resonated well together. So thank you. Thank and you. Really thank nice you all for coming. Help me sharpen up some of these. Exactly. Thank you.